Hello, and thank you for joining us to listen to this webinar on course structure and alignment with standards. This webinar is the second in a series of six that are being produced by the High School Pogel Initiative and the Pogel Project. This is actually a re-recording of information presented in the original webinar. We had some issues with sound quality during the first presentation, so our, we are re-recording uh, to give you a summary of the information that was presented. My name is Cindy Wingenroth, and I'm the coordinator of the high school programs for the Pogel Project. I will be serving in the role of host for this webinar, getting us started with some basic information about Pogel and wrapping things up at the close of our program. Our presenter for this webinar will be Amanda Zulo, and I'm going to ask Amanda to introduce herself to you now. My name is Amanda Zulo, and I am a high school chemistry teacher in northern New York, Saranac Lake, just south of the Canadian border. I've been teaching high school chemistry for seven years and utilizing POGO within my class. Any of these activities. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, our original presentation, we also had a, another helper with us, Carrie Jacobus, who is a chemistry and AP chemistry teacher at Riverdale High School in Oradell, New Jersey. Carrie served as a writing partner in the High School Pogel Initiative project, and she helped to author, review, and classroom test activities that are included in the collection. You'll be hearing more about those activities during the course of the presentation, and Carrie was helping us with monitoring chat during our event. I know that we will have a wide range of experience levels in our listening audience. Uh, so to get everyone at least a little bit of information about POGL um, before we get started with the evening, I want to give you a quick overview. So for you beginners and newbies out there, this will give you some basics to get started. Uh, for you experienced folks, this will be an overview. Um, but I want to start with a disclaimer that the information that we cover in this webinar is not meant to replace the experience and hands-on training that you get at a Google workshop. Our webinars instead are going to be kind of casual, conversational in nature, with classroom teachers who are currently implementing Google uh, having an opportunity to share their personal experiences and anecdotes. And this will hopefully help you see how Google theory translates into classroom practice and give you some points to think about when you're considering POGO activities and how they can fit into your specific classroom and curriculum. But to really get fully trained in using POGO beyond listening to the webinars, we encourage you to attend a, a training event, a workshop or a meeting or a presentation to get that hands-on experience. Our website always has information about events that are coming up, uh, so you can find that at Pogel.org, how to register and look for events that might be close to you. With that said, here's your quick overview. Pogel began in the 1990s with a group of professors who had become somewhat dissatisfied with the traditional lecture format and started looking for alternative kinds of setups for classrooms. And they began investigating different kinds of teaching and learning theories, and they really wanted to understand how students learn. And they found three kind of common themes that they pulled together into their Pogel theory. First was that teaching by telling does not work for most students. The second piece was that students who are part of an interactive community are most likely to be successful. And third, that knowledge is personal and students enjoy themselves more and develop greater ownership over course material when they are given an opportunity to construct their own understanding. What they really were hitting upon was constructivist learning theory and combining it with cooperative learning techniques. And using those two sort of pieces, they designed special activities for students to complete in groups that focused on core concepts and encouraged deep understanding of the curriculum they were covering. Each of the activities begins with data or a model 
uh, some information presented, and uh, that follows the learning cycle, the exploration phase, with questions that help you uh, think about and look at information in that model. The model is followed by a series of leading questions that were carefully crafted and scaffolded to guide students to a desired conclusion. And in the learning cycle, this corresponds to concept development or concept invention. And then the last part of an activity and the last part of the learning cycle is application. And the activity ends with questions that give students an opportunity to do something or use the knowledge or concept that they just kind of learned about. So in using these special activities that follow that learning cycle of exploration, concept invention, and application, they had a lot of success in their classrooms. And in 2003, they received a grant from the National Science Foundation to establish the Pogel Project. And they began presenting information at workshops about their experiences uh, at conferences and other large events and sharing the successes that they had. And they, they really developed a following. Uh, it eventually grew to include uh, science disciplines outside of chemistry and also other levels of instruction. Uh, particularly high school teachers were interested in trying to use the Pogel methodology and uh, were looking for materials that were appropriate for the high school level. And this led the project to search out other funding um, to further the growth of, of the project in that high school arena and led us to have the High School Pogel Initiative, the HISPI, H-S-P-I. It was funded by the Toyota USA Foundation in 2008 with three main goals of developing a collection of activities appropriate for high school so that teachers would have materials to use, uh, to train high school teachers in using Google in their classroom, and also to train them in sharing the methodology with others. And then thirdly, to develop a network of implementers across the country so that there would be support uh, for those teachers who are interested in using it. And that network is who is putting together these webinars uh, for our project. And I want to make a note of saying um, that they are volunteering to put on these webinars. I think it's really great and says something both about the network of people that we have helping us and also about their belief in the system, uh, in the methodology, that they're willing to volunteer their time to help share it with others. Uh, this year, uh, January of 2012, our activity collections were published that have been several years in the making, and we're very excited about their release through Flynn Scientific. Uh, right now, there are two of the four collections the HISPI group worked on are available, uh, the first year biology collection and the first year chemistry collection. We have AP collections in the works as well. The biology AP collection should be available to order through Flynn in April or May of this year. And the AP chemistry activities will follow in 2013. They'll be in next year's catalog. You'll see in looking at these activities, and Amanda will share some of this with you through her presentation, that all of the activities in this collection follow that learning cycle that I mentioned, uh, the exploration, the concept development or concept invention and application. All of the activities in the collection also include learning objectives, background knowledge prerequisites, extension questions, and assessment questions, which are all going to be helpful for you in placing these into your curriculum. Uh, the two other things I want to mention just quickly about the activities is something about the cost and the format. Um, the collections are each $49.95, so they're a fairly reasonable price. And the format that the collection comes in is a printed teacher manual with all the answer keys, and then a CD, a disc, with PDF files of the student versions of the activities so that you are purchasing something that you can continue to use. You print out just the number of activities that you want to use for your particular class. It's not a workbook that you have to keep purchasing. Um, you know, more and more copies. So that's a really nice feature and something that we worked hard uh, to get this in a format that we think is affordable and usable by teachers. And with that said, I'm going to turn things over to Amanda now for her to share the goals for the rest of the webinar and to get started with her portion of the presentation. Amanda. 
Thank you, Cindy. Just to outline some of the webinar goals here, the first are some considerations for implementing poll goals. In particular, some do's and don'ts based on your particular teaching situation, your classroom, your teaching style. The Pogo, the Pogo activities, and really how you go about enhancing the activities to get the most out of each individual activity. Some other topics we're going to cover here are embedding the activities into the curriculum you've already got to verify that we're meeting your state and the national level standards. It's important to note that all of our activities were developed in alignment with the various state and national curriculum. So we have outlined each activity in detail for New York State and Pennsylvania. And we feel pretty confident that we would be able to help you out to determine what states your activities meet. some of your everyday classroom ills. It can certainly help alleviate them. As we talked about, Cindy talked about earlier in the introduction, when students are taking ownership for their work, they become more vested. Likewise, they're more likely to accept answers that maybe are different than what really built on their learning and it was a more enjoyable process for them as well as for myself guiding them through. But one thing for sure, these activities are not designed to be a complete curriculum. So please don't buy the activity books, print them all out and expect you're going to be set for the year. One example of this is the Inside the Atom activity, which I typically run in my classroom sometime in October. When doing this activity, I use it to review subatomic particles, introduce isotopic notation, and the concept of isotopes for my students. This is at the start of our atomic structure unit. But once we're done with that activity, we're not done with those topics. So from here, I end up going into working on some other aspects, in particular focusing on isotopes and the subatomic particles. To enhance the Pogol experience, I will have students build particle models of varying isotopes and trade those models with other students in the class. The students will then write the appropriate isotopic notation for what they've received. One of the good things I found is that this totally enhances the need of the tactile learners within my classroom. It reinforces what was gained from the Pogol activity, as well as it provides just a different view of the subatomic particles of where things like the mass and the atomic number came from for the students that were really struggling to understand it. Once I'm confident in my students have an understanding of the isotope concept, I'll then move on to the next activity in the series, which is the average atomic mass activity. Now, based on the order you teach your curriculum, you may or you may move through the activities in the provided order. All in all, there's no right or wrong order to complete the activities. The best order you could possibly select them is the order that you are most comfortable with within your classroom based on your students, the structure of your curriculum, and how well you're assessing your students and how much they're learning. To give you an idea, all in all, I may use about two POGO activities per week in some topics, and in other topics, I may only use one or two the entire time. Kind of as a heads up, I would not Roll benefit from it. You gain a lot by using 
different techniques within your classroom because you're able to present the material in a variety of manners that meets the needs of your student. This Pogel technique is one technique, in fact, the most frequent one I use within my activity. So you may be wondering, if I haven't been using Pogel, what do I need to expect? Well, when you start to implement them, the biggest thing I can advise you on is the fact that it's going to be uncomfortable for you, and it's going to be uncomfortable for your students. But remember, discomfort isn't always bad. You know your students will be benefiting from this constructivist, cooperative learning. Be patient and supportive with them. For many of your students, this is the first time the learning of material and content has been placed on them in this manner. Supplement the activities as you see fit with other items. Have students write daily summaries, like, what did you learn today? So that you can gauge the effectiveness of the pogles. Most importantly, keep running through any difficulties and relax. We have a few resources to help you through this implementation process. First and foremost, you can use the personal effectiveness videos within the Pogo implementation guide off of the website. When I use those with my students, I found even if it was highlighting a behavior some of them were experiencing, they watched someone else with that behavior, they'd make a few comments about it, but in the end, that behavior, the negative behavior in my class disappeared, and the behaviors I was stating You keep track of how many times they've used one of those provided statements. The benefit to this is that it takes the focus off of this new learning technique that you're utilizing and puts the focus on doing something different, learning something new. Some people have often asked, what do I do if students are mocking the roles? The good news about that is that you know they're reading and understanding what should be done. So, and in the end, you can use some sort of assessment, such as the assessment question. Did my students learn the content I was looking to get across today? For students within the resource room or with special needs, and I've had many, many of these students as a small rural school, this is for staff and even the interested parents with an answer key. There able we're going to lead them to the answers through good questioning. One big thing to keep in mind, and I'll tell you I've made this mistake and after doing it I, would, I regretted it for a while, don't leave the activities with us up. And the sub can't provide in the way you as their classroom teacher can. So the sub really won't have the know-how of executing summaries and mini lectures. Most importantly, be present for the POGO activity. It's an experience for you as much as it is for your students. It's important to keep in mind our students these days get a lot of handouts
kids were doing a Kogel activity. It's just one. These are cooperative in nature and a good introduction to concepts, so they're not the ideal tool to be giving out as homework. We have 38 minute class periods here, and I know a lot of times I'll have just a few questions left at the end. I will never assign those as homework. I really want my kids to be in the environment here while they're doing them. So that's where you can say, hey, write three or four sentences about what you learned today as the homework assignment. Or you can have another assignment ready for them. But the activities are meant to be cooperative. Then not a good idea to give these activities as a homework assignment. Now, one of the things coming up all over the place, I feel like for us high school teachers, is the alignment with standards. These were designed with the national content standards in mind. And then there were several of us from many different states that worked on them. And as we worked on the activities, we made sure that they also aligned within our state standards. The activities were then classroom tested among a variety of states. So we're pretty sure that they align with whatever your particular state standard is. Here we're going to outline how the activities align with the Common Core, which as of right now is only adopted in the math and language arts. We will also tie the Pogel activities to the old science standards, which are currently being redefined into the new conceptual framework for science education. There's a general list, um, the National Research Council, the National Academy of Press, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. We could get into the administrative pieces um, that lead into these standards. In Yeah. Say the same thing. In Pennsylvania standards to align with the Regents in the Keystone exams. And we're very certain that they would also align to whatever your state standards may be. The first thing we're going to discuss here, and for a lot of us it's kind of a new topic, is this framework for science education. And this is the new science. Framework of efforts to define foundational knowledge and skills that are important for K-12 students. From this, the cross-cutting concepts to be designed so that students can continually build and revise their knowledge and abilities over a number of years. And that aligns with the fact that it takes time to develop these concepts. And then last but not least, the support and integration of the knowledge and abilities with practice that are needed outside of the classroom to engage in scientific inquiry and engineering design. Slide 16 provides a quick and overarching view of what the Council's 300 page paper was communicating. As a teacher, a lot of this I'm already doing within my classroom. The Pogla activities were developed based on a full learning cycle that takes students through the exploring models, developing concepts, and applying those to situations. 
I can pretty confidently say that most of the activities I've seen easily meet the majority of subdivisions underneath each of the three divisions. One particular feature, and you heard Cindy mention it, was the style of questioning used within the POGO activity. Given that I'm a bit more of a graphic learner, is of the learning cycle that the POGO activities meet. As has been stated, each activity was developed with particular core concepts or core objectives in mind. In all reality, those concepts are questions that are designed to help students explore models in an effort to lay the foundation for constructing knowledge. The concept development questions are usually convergent or divergent questions that elicit student answers about the material and pretty much have them construct the main concept of the activity. Within our activities, these are often indicated with little keys. The scientific and engineering processes are seen through pattern recognition of the models by exploration questions. Likewise, and then many of the application questions focus on students using the knowledge and applying it to a new situation. This type of question really supports concept learning because you've got to have a pretty good grip on that knowledge to properly use it and apply it to something new. Now the cross-cutting of concepts is accentuated within concept development and also within application questions where people will begin to apply the idea. There are varying types and different levels of questions, lower order, such as your exploration, to higher order, those development and application questions. And they're supported by tight framework and scaffolding within the POGOL activities. The purpose behind the activities and all of the questions is to ensure that as students are executing the exploration, the concept development, and the application, they're not developing misconceptions. And as we're going to see within the next few slides, a lot of our activities, particulate, macroscopic, and microscopic models to help prevent and deter misconception development. There are numerous places within each of the collection that we could have for you. This particular slide is model one from the gas variable activity. There are 11 questions that were developed on it. in the relationship between the independent and dependent variables and write an algebraic expression using the variables which relate to the experiment. The students were also here asked to apply a rationale. For that, you can use it to determine if the students have the type of understanding in your class. Now this activity has around 20 questions of varying levels on it. And it's not that we have 20 questions extracting nothing. The 20 questions are tightly scaffold and Is that 
On this are concept development and application questions that cross the concept with students connecting structure and function of the leap. To do this, not only do they have to weave together the pattern in their mind, but they need to determine cause and effect along with having a basis knowledge of photosynthesis. And while for some of us the first question may not seem too hard, we do have to approach it from the view of the students. Up to this point, they've had limited experience with these concepts. The green color of the chloroplast, again, connecting to other items. One example of really nailing home a core content question, which is what these activities are designed to do, is within this Columbic Attraction activity. Up to this point, we've outlined some concepts, such as positive and negative charge attract. Then we've outlined, OK, this is how strongly they attract. And one of the reasons you want your students to develop knowledge of this is so that they understand things like atomic radius. They understand the impact the protons do have on the electrons and their shell. So this activity here looks at the force between protons and electrons in an atom. And I know for myself, having taught seven years, this is something I find very challenging. first in understanding why lithium's radius was smaller and why, as you go across the periodic table, the radiuses decrease based on the force the proton has on the electrons. Grade level and department to outline how we can likely your state is one. And these Pogel activities, I was surprised when I looked at them because they do lend themselves nicely to the common core standards. For example, within an English class, you could have students write an essay or a paragraph about what they learned from the activity. relate to the activity. Within a history class, when you're doing some of the historical significance of that discovery, or you can have students research what was going on politically, which might foster some good conversation within your classroom about the atom and its actual impact on the world and the political environment. While math would seem to lend itself nicely to science, I always like to believe science depends a little bit more. Math depends a little bit more on science than science does math. But you can connect the two. And if you talk with your math teachers, you may be surprised they are willing and ready to take any. My students took all of their knowledge and make sure that they really had a great understanding of the concept. So while many of us are running for the hills when we hear the talk about the common core, in all reality, these are they'll be able to apply it outside of our classroom. And they'll just have a 
overall better learning experience. And that's what we want to inspire our students to go off and learn more. Thanks so much, Amanda. So now Cindy's going to work. So thanks so much, Amanda, for sharing all your experiences and your insight on uh, integrating Pogo activities into your curriculum and all that background on the Common Core and the standards. Uh, that's helpful for us all to understand. Uh, future webinars that we have coming up, uh, well, actually our first webinar was on uh, arranging your classroom and some basic facilitation skills, and a recording of that is available on the Pogo website. Uh, this recording will be available on the Pogo website for this course structure and alignment with standards or webinar. Next month, we'll be discussing assessment in a Pogo classroom and communication. Uh, April 19th, we're going to be taking a close look at a Pogo activity and really seeing uh, in more detail, Amanda shared some this evening, but in more detail uh, how uh, the questioning and the scaffolding of questions in the Pogo activity works. In May 17th, we're going to look at group dynamics and talk about that cooperative learning piece. And in June, our last event, we're going to be talking about reporting out, uh, which is a, a way of sharing in a POGO classroom, a kind of formative assessment, and helping students make connections. Uh, again, the recordings will be available on the POGO website, and much of what we've talked about uh, this evening and throughout all the webinars is available in our HISPE implementation guide. That is an interactive guide that lives on the POGO website. Uh, you can find it under the resources tab on our website. It has lots of information including videos that Amanda referenced, uh, handouts, forms for you to use, uh, examples and some, some great um, short video clips of examples of POGO being used in a classroom to help give you a a hands-on perspective of what it looks like. Thank you so much for participating and listening. Again, we encourage you to have an actual hands-on learning experience with Pogol by attending an event. And you can sign up for that on the Pogol website, pogol.org uh, events. If you have any other questions or comments about uh, Pogol activities and the High School Pogol Initiative, feel free to contact me, Cindy Wengenroth, at cindy.w at Thanks.